I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 20% of the world's breeds of cattle, goats, pigs, poultry, and horses are on the verge of extinction. That's because the industrialized food movement has forever changed the way that livestock is used in agriculture. As certain breeds were selected for their rapid growth, other breeds that didn't fit into the mold fell by the wayside. But over the last 50 years, their populations have been declining at an alarming rate. But thanks to the rising popularity of organic agriculture and sustainable practices, heritage breeds are being rediscovered along with the importance that they play in the big picture. One of the organizations at the forefront of this movement is the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. It's their mission to not only research endangered breeds and serve as an educational resource for the public, but also to coordinate some of the conservation efforts across the country. Jeanette Berenger is the Research and Technical Programs Manager. Part of her job is to help educate people about the importance of heritage breeds and when needed, help them choose the right breed for their given situation. Heritage breeds are incredibly important and the more I learn about them, the more I'm blown away by just how special they are. They have this unique connectiveness with all of us in our history, our culture, our agricultural heritage and they represent some qualities that we don't find in commercial animals like the ability to thrive in challenging environments and not need heated barns to be able to make it through the winter or to be coddled and, and protected just to thrive in the pasture and so they really are special in that they they have a job and they're really good at it and they can uh, be long-lived, they can mate naturally, and the, in a lot of instances they can be easy keepers and make a wonderful addition to anybody's small farm. The definition of heritage confuses people sometimes because it's so broadly used. And American Livestock Breeds Conservancy spends a lot of effort into trying to define exactly what that is so that word really has meaning and you know packs a punch with it. So what do we mean by heritage? Well, it's a number of things. Uh, for animals, first, they need to have a long productive lifespan. Uh, another one is that they have to be able to thrive in a challenging environment and not depend upon a warm barn to keep them happy. They have to breed naturally, which is pretty darn important. And there are a lot of commercial breeds that are used that have lost the ability to breed naturally. So that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty important. And uh, also they need to be of purebred stock, meaning that their parents and their grandparents are purebred animals and uh, the offspring are that same breed. Heritage breeds really uh, got a hard knock in the 20th century with the beginning of commercial agriculture. And a few breeds rose to the occasion. They produced more meat in a shorter period of time. Whereas a lot of breeds, they were very specialized in being able to do one particular thing in one particular environment really well. And they didn't make the cut in commercial industry. After World War II, you had a lot of people coming back for more. You had the baby boom, a lot of people to be fed in short order. And so you really needed to have a lot of produce in a very short period of time. And that's where commercial agriculture really came into full bloom. But that also took away the niches of the heritage breeds and little by little they disappeared because their jobs were taken away from them. All right, a lot of people ask us if a breed disappears, so what? Well, the so what's actually pretty important. Uh, when we lose a breed that hasn't been well documented, 
we just don't know what we're losing. That could be something like disease resistance. It could be a big one in global warming, being able to thrive in a challenging environment. A lot of the commercial breeds or the common breeds can't do that. And many of these heritage breeds, they were designed to do just that job. And that's a pretty important thing to, to lose in the long run. We've had some great improvements over the past decade because as people are looking more towards sustainable methods of agriculture than commercial, that's the best place these heritage breeds fit in. One great uh, gain we've had over the past decade is with heritage turkeys where when we first started looking at how many were left, there were only about a thousand birds left of all the heritage turkey breeds combined. And today, because of all the work that's been done in educating people, educating new farmers on how to grow these animals and breed these animals, we now have you know, over quadruple the population of breeding animals that we used to have. And everybody knows what a heritage turkey is now, and they're finding their way back to the American table. So turkeys are a great success. We have some work ahead of us as far as some of the heritage breeds that aren't quite ready for prime time because these animals lost their jobs when commercial agriculture came into its full power. We need to get their jobs back, but we also have to get these animals ready for their jobs. And that means teaching people how to breed them properly and to get really productive, good looking animals back on the ground. A lot of those traditional methods are only in books and there are fewer and fewer people to, to learn from to be able to do this. But the end result is you've got fantastic meats and eggs and milk products that are full of flavor and offer people a different choice besides what we find in the supermarket. So how can you help with the conservation effort? Well first, you don't have to go out and start raising large numbers of endangered breeds. In fact, not breeding properly can actually hinder rather than help the conservation efforts. But what you can do is support the farmers and stores and restaurants that carry the heritage breed products. Most of the breeds are raised on small family farms for specialty products like goat cheese and fiber arts. So when you put your dollars to support their efforts, in turn you're supporting the heritage breed movement. And lastly, if you have a particular breed of animal you're interested in, like sheep or goats or chickens, join a conservation group because your dues will go to help the cause and you can stay informed on specific ways that you can help that breed. Now if somebody wanted to add a heritage animal of any type to their farm or to their house, are there certain common characteristics that they need to look for? Sure, absolutely. There are a lot of questions that you need to ask yourself before you even bring an animal onto a farm. First you have to ask yourself, what kind of infrastructure do you have? Uh, is it going to fit that particular species you're thinking of? The other thing is, uh, what are you expecting from this animal? In the case of chickens, do you want a meat chicken? Do you want an egg chicken? Do you want a little bit of both? Then you ask, well, what kind of climate are you in? Because not every chicken's going to be great for a hot climate or a cold climate. And you also ask yourself the very last question, which is, do you like it? You know, if you don't like it, then your chances of success is going to be very small. Well, in gardening, a lot of people buy a plant because they think it's pretty, but they don't have any idea whether or not it's going to survive in the climate that they're in. So the thing that I always talk about is put the right plant in the right place. Exactly, and that boils down to working with Mother Nature, who happens to work for cheap if you've got the right job for her. I get it. With so many people building backyard chicken flocks these days, I'm not sure a whole lot of thought goes into you know, what they do to pick them out, other than the fact that they might be pretty. But there are tricks to know whether you have a, a good chicken, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the story's really underneath the feathers, and I'm always surprised at how many people don't pick up their chickens to check them out. Um, to start, uh, one thing that it can be more obvious is actually the width of their skull. When you're comparing two chickens, the one you want is the one with the broader head. And that's because if they've got a broad head, that will typically follow down the rest of their body. You'll then have a really broad heart girth where their uh, lungs and hearts are. Broad heart girth means great capacity for lungs and heart to be more productive, grow faster. Follow the body further, you've got really nice wide hips. That's more capacity for egg laying and reproduction, so you want a nice broad hips. If you can't get your eyes on the birds, the first thing would be compare those heads. You want the one with the broader head. 
Okay, so where does somebody go once they've added their chickens and they want to move on to another animal? What's the next thing on the horizon that's popular or becoming so? Well, another, uh, the next logical step might be rabbits. A lot of people incorporate chickens with rabbits because the rabbits can be housed in elevated cages and the chickens can forage uh, among the manure under the cages for insects and stuff and create some beautiful compost for gardens. And the ultimate compost is rabbit poop. You also have goats. Goats are pretty easy to keep and they're pretty darn practical in that they can help clear land for you. They're fairly easy to manage. Uh, the biggest trick with goats is finding a fence that'll keep them in. But once you've got that, they're wonderful, versatile pets. So Jeanette, as more and more farmers consider raising heritage breeds as opposed to the commercial alternatives, are they able to even compete on price? Well, as far as the cost of the animals, they're going to be more expensive because they're rare. And so they're going to be harder to come by and it's going to be more expensive to purchase them. But when you have these animals, they have real good value added opportunities with them in that they are more flavorful. They grow more slowly, so they're going to have more flavor. They can do all kinds of jobs on your property, from security guard to cutting your grass <laughs> to turning your compost to almost uh, anything you can think of. The sky's the limit with the tasks that some of these animals can do for you. And the manure makes great compost, right? It's like gold, <laughs> and that's the only reason I've convinced my husband to be able to have horses. <laughs> Our soil fertility has gone through the roof with them. Okay, I think you just a lot more people on that one. And if you'd like more information on heritage breeds, well, we have that on our website and it's under the show notes for this episode. The website address, it's the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. So a great example of how heritage breeds are making a comeback is with the Leicester Longwell sheep. Now they were bred in England in the 17th century and widely popular in America in the 13 colonies. In fact, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington had them on their plantations. But by the mid 19th century, this breed was considered highly endangered and we almost lost an important part of our American heritage. But thanks to a focused conservation effort in the last 20 years, the wool from this breed is considered one of the most sought after in the fiber arts trade. Now, in addition to the history and conservancy efforts of this animal, heritage breeds are important for another reason. They're highly adaptable to sustainable agriculture. There's been a big shift in recent years towards more organic and sustainable farming practices as people look for healthier choices for themselves and the environment. And some farmers have taken that shift even a step further by going beyond sustainability, but making the earth better than it was. And heritage breeds play a big part in that movement. A good example of that is Grass Central in Potomac, Maryland. Matt Rail started his small scale farm by building a sustainable ecosystem where the heritage animals such as cows, ducks, chickens, and pigs work together to convert grass rather than grain into highly nutritious milk, meat, and eggs. Our system of farming is a restorative and regenerative agriculture. Um, we go beyond sustainable in that we are actually managing the land with animals to produce higher levels of biodiversity and ultimately a more functional ecosystem and heritage breeds of livestock fit perfectly into that process. So Matt, you said your farming system is even beyond sustainability. Uh, restorative is your term. And I know that grass plays an important role in that, as does heritage breeds. So can you give me a little bit of how that ties together and why that's so important? Absolutely. Um, well, the heritage breeds, many of them, have never been fed any grain in their genetic history. Oh. So they're completely adapted to a grass-based farming system. And a grass-based farming system is actually a healing farming system. It builds and heals soil, and it creates a product, whether it's meat, milk, or eggs, um, that has a nutrient profile that is very high and complex. So the, the fat, the egg yolks, and the milk um, are, are loaded with all kinds of nutrients from the grass and those heritage breeds are genetically adapted to efficiently utilizing grass. Wow. So Matt, these are some happy, hungry cows chomping away and these are all heritage breeds, right? Yes, they are. Um, these are specifically Dutch belts and um, we have chosen them for, for a couple specific reasons. One, they're very maternal. They can raise multiple calves and not just one because they produce an abundance of high butterfat milk and they can also 
Uh, they're also very productive in a grass-based system. They can eat grass alone and no grain uh, and still be productive. Another breed that we raise are the Berkshire pigs, and we raise those mainly for their fat content and profile. It's very moist pork. It has a, a high fat content, which lends itself to the cooking process well. And they're also very good foragers for roots, earthworms, acorns, all kinds of nuts and seeds and grass. Tell me about some of the variety of the poultry that you have. Well, we have uh, Menorca chickens, uh, which are a Mediterranean breed. Um, we have hot summers here, and they're very fast, so they're very good at running down, chasing down grasshoppers and crickets, and, um, uh, and staying away from the feed trough. And you raise heritage ducks too, right? We do. We raise a heritage egg-laying breed of duck called Khaki Campbells, a very traditional heritage breed. Um, they're also uh, a, a really grass-efficient bird. They eat a lot of grass. Uh, they eat flies, and they're just very suited to um, a functional ecosystem. So now, of all those benefits that you described of those heritage breeds, honestly, that kind of sounds like what ducks and chickens and cows do anyway. They just kind of eat everything and chase down everything that's before them. But you're saying that the heritage breeds are much more efficient at that then. They really are. Um, the heritage breeds are actually very rare. There's not many of them in this world. Uh, and if your system of farming is predicated at all on a natural ecosystem, we need animals that can function effectively in that ecosystem. And the heritage breeds are best suited for that? They're 100% best suited for the job. Heritage breeds have played such an important role in our past, but considering the environmental impact of agriculture and the diversity of food choices, they play even a more important role in the future. And it all starts with education, and you can start by learning more right on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. And there you can also watch all of our past episodes as well as this one too. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.